I guess it really.
All right, everyone. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Stop sharing here. All right, so uh, for our presenters, can you all give me a nod if you can hear me all right? All right, great. So um, well, welcome for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, um, welcome for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, welcome for uh, joining us this evening. Uh, all right, let's try that again. Can everybody hear me fine now? Let's try that again. Okay. Everybody hear me fine now. So, got a big echo, Bill. Start again. Thank you all for joining us on this chilly fall evening. Uh, so I'm Dr. Billy Teets, and I am the outreach astronomer and also the active director here at Vanderbilt University's Air Observatory. So we're going to have another great program this evening. We're going to be uh, checking out some objects that we've never seen before on this program. Um, and one thing I want to encourage you all is that as we are going through um, the hey, Billy, going through, um, hey, Billy. Uh, the Billy. Hey, Billy. Uh, Nathan, is that for me? Uh, yes. Nathan, is that for me? Yes. Yes. Nathan, is that for me? Yes. Yes. You have an infinite. You have an infinite echo going. You have an infinite. You have an infinite echo going. You have an infinite. You have an infinite echo going. So do I. So do I. I'm trying to figure out where it's coming from. Brian. I'm trying to figure out where it's coming from. Brian. I'm trying to figure out where it's coming from. Is it gone? Can you all hear me now? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm not hearing the echo coming back. I think we're good. Okay. All righty. So let. Third time's a charm, right? All right, so let's try this one more time. So again, welcome everyone for joining us this evening uh, here um, on our program with the, the virtual star party. Um, very nice, cool evening. Uh, great for, for doing uh, observations. Um, I'm Dr. Billy Teets and I am the outreach astronomer here at Vanderbilt University's Dyer Observatory. And I'm also the acting director at the time. Uh, so tonight, as we go through our program, we're going to be checking out a lot of different objects that we haven't seen before, uh, at least on this program. Um, and as we're, we're talking about these different things and you know, discussing different concepts, please make sure to uh, post questions into the YouTube chat. If I recall correctly, you have to be logged into YouTube to be able to chat, but I could be wrong on that. So, um, but please do post questions. Um, also, um, one thing we would also like you to encourage you to do is uh, post suggestions for different topics that you would like to see in future programs or maybe some objects that you would like to see. Um, we'd love to hear from you all on that. So we've got another great program this evening. We've got presenters uh, from here at Dyer Observatory, uh, the Barnard Seaford Astronomical Society, the Memphis Astronomical Society, and Bayes Mountain Park and Planetarium. Um, but before we dive into it, I also want to give a big shout out to a few people that are working diligently behind the scenes to make sure everything uh, is working out correctly. Uh, we've got Brian Smokler from VU uh, News and Communications, and we've also got a couple of my colleagues here at Dyer Observatory, uh, Mr. Nathan Griffin and Mr. Alex Rockefeller. So I want to thank all of them for all of their hard work and all of our presenters for helping make this possible this evening. So um, let's go ahead and dive right on into it. So our first object of discussion for this evening is going to be the planet Saturn. So let me share my screen right quick. All righty. So now you all should be able to, to see Saturn. Uh, my presenters could give me a nod, yes or no, if we can see it. All right, thank you. So um, you can see Saturn is wobbling around just a little bit. It's not actually doing that. That's an effect of our atmosphere. And as the air above us is moving around, like tonight you can go out and you can feel a little bit of a, a breeze out there, but in the upper layers of the atmosphere and in all these different layers that have different temperatures and densities, all those layers are moving. And as the light from Saturn or the moon or the stars comes through those moving layers, it bounces around. And that's what causes our planets to kind of move around like this, causes the stars to twinkle. But um, as we say uh, tonight, our seeing is pretty good. We can, we can actually see quite a bit of detail in Saturn. So one thing I want to point out 
is that um, obviously Saturn has its magnificent ring system. Um, you'll notice that the rings don't extend uh, really visibly anyway in this view all the way down to the, the top of the atmosphere of Saturn. Um, there, there are ring particles down in here, but they just aren't as, as visible in our view here. Um, you'll notice that within the band of the rings, we see this, this very thin black line that's kind of going in and out. Um, and so that black line is known as the Cassini division. And it's actually caused by a moon that's in orbit around Saturn. But we'll talk about that in just a moment. And I'll show you what that, that moon actually is. So let me bring up the, the gain, kind of overexpose Saturn here. I want to get some faint objects visible. All right, so there we are. So now we have um, a couple of the moons here. In fact, let me zoom out just a bit. Right up here, this big bright moon, that is Titan, second largest moon in the solar system, uh, largest moon of Saturn, only moon that in the solar system to really have a substantial atmosphere. It's mostly nitrogen, uh, very cold on that moon. Uh, several hundred degrees below zero Fahrenheit. But you'll notice that around Saturn, we've got a few of the other moons, uh, which are noticeably smaller than Titan. But on a good clear night, if you've got good dark skies, good seeing, and a decent sized telescope, you can actually pick out uh, about four or five of these moons. And then when you look at them on consecutive nights, you'll see that they've actually moved quite a bit. Um, so let me bring the exposure back down here. There's one other thing that I wanted to, oops, wrong button here. There's one other thing that I wanted to kind of point out. And if we zoom in on Saturn just a bit, you'll notice that its atmosphere is not perfectly uniform. Uh, there's a little bit of a banding to the atmosphere. And so if you remember when we looked at Jupiter in our previous star parties, we could really see a lot of uh, features in the atmosphere of Jupiter. We can see some atmosphere, uh, atmospheric features in Saturn as well. And a lot of those bands are really created by high winds on Saturn. Um, in fact, Saturn's got some of the highest winds in the solar system, uh, only uh, surpassed by Neptune as it turns out. But now let me switch over and uh, do a, a quick little presentation um, just to show you some other things uh, about Saturn. Just give me one second. Sure. All right. Okay, so can everybody see the, the multiple views of Saturn now? Okay, thank you. All right, uh, let me go back here. So this is, or these are, I should say, multiple views of Saturn taken over a number of years, actually about 11 years by an amateur astronomer. Um, but what we see is that Saturn looks like it's changing its tilt. Now, Saturn is tilted over on its axis about like the Earth is tilted. It's actually just a bit more. But um, as a result of that, uh, we see Saturn at these apparent different tilts as Saturn is orbiting around the sun. So every year as we take a look at Saturn, when it's nice and high in our evening sky, we see Saturn in a little bit different position in its orbit. But because it keeps that tilt in the same direction, we see it appear to change its tilt, but it's not actually changing its tilt. It's just our viewing perspective that's changing. Uh, one thing you'll notice is that when the rings go edge on, they are really, really thin. In fact, they're not perfectly edge on in this view. Um, when the rings go perfectly edge on to us, uh, for a, a couple days, about every 15 years, they are so thin that we cannot see them at all not even the most powerful telescopes in the world, not even the Hubble Space Telescope is able to pick out the rings. Because from one side to another, these rings are about 180,000 miles wide, but they're much less than a single mile thick. So if you wanted to make an actual scale model of the rings of Saturn uh, by using a sheet of paper, uh, your sheet of paper would actually have to be about as wide as six or seven football fields. So they are super, super thin, but they're mostly ice particles. If you took all the rings and you, and you basically smushed it together uh, to form a single object, it would basically make an object about the size of one of Saturn's small icy moons. And in fact, it's thought that maybe these prominent rings were caused by a moon getting too close into Saturn and Saturn's gravitational forces, what astronomers refer to as the tidal forces, basically ripped apart that moon to form these rings. So speaking about uh, seasons, and uh, tilts, so uh, if you have a tilt on your axis, then you have seasonal changes. That's what causes our seasons here on the Earth. It's not our distance from the sun. 
uh, but it's actually the tilt on our axis. So our seasons are caused by the changing amount of daylight and how high and direct the sunlight actually comes in on the Earth as a result of our tilt. So you can see that the other planets, uh, a lot of them have tilts very similar to the Earth. Um, so Mars, Saturn, and Neptune are, all have similar tilts to us. Jupiter, it's almost straight up and down, so it really doesn't have much of a seasonal change. Um, Venus is kind of uh, basically upside down, which is why it has this super extreme tilt. But I bring this up because when we see, uh, uh, when we get a view of Saturn during its equinox, when basically the sun is over e its equator, we get a really neat view, especially if we have a probe in orbit around Saturn. So this was a view taken from the Cassini spacecraft uh, several years ago. Uh, Cassini was actually deorbited into Saturn back in 2017. But uh, what, there's a couple of things I want you to notice on this. So this is taken, this picture is taken during um, the Saturn equinox. So just like here on Earth, when we have an equinox, the sun is directly over the equator of the Earth. So in this view, the sun is directly over Saturn's equator. And that's also where the rings orbit. Normally we would see shadows of the rings on the planet, but this very, very thin strip right here, this very thin hairline band, that's actually the shadow of the rings, just to kind of give you an idea of how thin those rings are. The rings aren't nice and bright like we saw in the previous images because the sun is basically at the side of the rings. And so it's not above them to kind of shine down and illuminate them and make them appear very bright. Uh, but we see that the rings are illuminated a little bit, and that's because of reflected sunlight off of Saturn itself. So it's a really cool view. Uh, we can't get a view like this from the Earth because uh, Saturn's orbiting out past Earth's orbit. So we don't get to see it in this nice, uh, almost half, uh, if you want to say half moon phase, if you will. But it's a, it's a really cool view there. Um, and then the rings, just to mention that they are not solid, they are made up of countless numbers of tiny particles ranging from dust grain size objects to uh, basically boulders the size of a house. But they organize themselves into all these ringlets. Um, so all of these uh, rings are in orbit around Saturn. So this is a nice close-up view uh, taken by the Cassini spacecraft. Um, so the rings have kind of been compressed here to get them to fit on the screen. Now, um, that gap that I mentioned earlier, that here is that gap, the Cassini division. You'll notice it's not totally empty, it does have some material in it. But as I mentioned, that's actually caused by a moon. And this is the moon that's doing it, it's called Mimas. And if you're a Star Wars fan, the first thing you think about is uh, the Death Star. Turns out uh, George Lucas came out with the Death Star about two years before the first image of Mimas was ever taken. So he didn't get his idea from that. But this moon, it's actually orbiting around Saturn as well. Now, if you were inside of this Cassini division, the time that it, take you, it took you to take two orbits around Saturn, Mimas would take exactly one orbit. So you would, as we say, be in a resonance with Mimas. So particles keep meeting up with Mimas in the same spots in their orbit. And as a result, Mimas' gravity kind of clears out that area. So some of these other divisions, uh, like the Inca division, that's a result of a resonance with the moon as well. So uh, we even see resonances like this in the asteroid belt. So I wanted to uh, just finish by mentioning that uh, we've got a conjunction coming up in December. So if you've seen Jupiter and Saturn in the night sky, in fact, you can go out, um, uh, uh, should still be up by nine o'clock. But go out, you'll see Jupiter is a really bright object in the southwestern sky. Saturn's the bright object just to the, the left or the east of it. Um, watch them over the next couple of months. And on a week at a time, you'll see that they're getting closer and closer in our sky. They're not actually getting closer together, but from our viewpoint, they are. On December 21st, they will get so close to one another from our viewpoint here on the Earth that it will likely look like they form a single object. Uh, this is what we call a conjunction, and two objects get pretty close to one another in the sky. So this is about 5.15 in the evening on December 21st. Now, if you have a telescope, this is the view that you can get in the telescope. So uh, for a comparison, uh, the separation between Jupiter and Saturn here is about one-fourth, or actually about one-fifth of a full moon diameter. So that's a really, really tiny separation. So if you've got a telescope, you'd be able to see both of these planets and some of their moons, like the moons we have here for Jupiter and the moons we have here for Saturn, 
um, you'd be able to see all of those at the same time. Um, by the next day or the day prior to this, they'll actually be separated by a little bit more and it'll be difficult, if not impossible, to get them in the same view of the telescope. So um, be sure to put that on your calendar, hope for clear weather. Um, we'll probably be doing a live streaming view of it, so um, hopefully we'll have some good clear skies. But uh, they actually get together in the sky about once every 20 years. But this conjunction happens to be a really, really close conjunction. Okay, it only gets this close about every 400 or so years. So, so that is all that I have uh, for, uh, for Saturn. Before we move on, let's see if we've got a couple of questions, which by the way, um, as we go through our program, if you're joining us for the first time, we'll take a few questions in between presentations and then we'll uh, have a longer question answer session at the end. Um, so, Question, do the objects that make Saturn's rings all orbit at the same speed? And the answer is no. So uh, Johannes Kepler back in the uh, 1600s, I think it was the 1600s, I can't remember, it was late 1500s, early 1600s, came up with the, uh, his three laws of planetary motion. Basically, if you've got an object orbiting, say, a planet, the closer it is to the planet, the faster it has to go around the planet. So all of those, those individual ringlets, they're all orbiting Saturn at different speeds. So the closer they are in to Saturn, the faster that they're going to, to, to orbit Saturn. And then the farther out they are, uh, the slower they're going to orbit. Okay. All right, um, I have probably gone over my time there. So give me one second. All righty. So now we are going to head over to uh, Goodlettsville and we're going to visit with Thea, Thea Wellington. Uh, she's a member of the Barnard Seaford Astronomical Society. Uh, she's also a NASA Solar System JPL, um, or excuse me, a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador. Uh, she's got a really nice telescope out tonight looking at a, a galaxy that we often refer to as M31. So I'm gonna turn it over to Theo. And is it possible that somebody else could step in first? I'm really, really close, but I haven't quite got it into the camera yet. Um, Adam, uh, would you like to, to go ahead and move up? Are you, is that okay? Yeah. Or do you... I was gonna see what Theo was saying. Is that okay? Is that okay for you, you want me to go? Yeah, would you be able to go now? Are you ready to, to go? I'm ready. Okay. Yeah. So uh, slight change of plans. We're actually gonna go over to East Tennessee and visit with Adam Fans at the Bayes Mountain Park and Planetarium. So um, Adam's been into astronomy since he was 12 years old and he uh, received a master's degree in astronomy and education uh, at the University of Florida. And he's been at Bayes Mountain since 1992 doing lots and lots of education. So we're gonna turn it over to Adam and check out a really cool cluster tonight. Uh, thank you. Um, well, uh, yeah, I'll do a little switcheroo here with our scheduling, but that's okay. So I've got an interesting double object, which is called the double cluster. As you can guess by the name, it is a double cluster. It's two open clusters of stars that are seen very close to each other in the night sky, and they are physically near each other as well. Um, they're, you know, close enough. So um, it's an interesting feature. So what I'm going to be doing here, I have a, a, a number of ways of showing this. First of all, I'm going to show you what my camera is getting right now. As you can see, it's not showing a whole lot of stars. Um, and that's mainly because my camera can't get super duper faint objects in a live setting. Let me show you this picture for just a quick moment. Where is the double cluster in the sky? So here you should be seeing uh, two constellations that I've highlighted. Notice the northeast direction. This is tonight, and you'll see it like this for the next uh, month or so, but as the months go on, the difference will be is that these objects will be seen higher and higher in the sky as they arc across the sky, and eventually you'll see them in the north, in the uh, northwest sky. Um, 
about four months, four to five months from now. The double cluster is in between two constellations, Cassiopeia and Perseus. Cassiopeia is known as Queen Cassiopeia. And uh, it is, there's, there's a whole story that goes along with Cassiopeia as well as Perseus and Andromeda and Pegasus and Cetus. Uh, there's a lot there and also includes Medusa. So please look that story up. Uh, we don't have enough time for the story right now, but um, the W shape of Cassiopeia is very recognizable. And there's actually one other, one extra star that can be uh, used to kind of create her uh, throne uh, seen upside down. And so she's actually sitting upside down in the throne, which is part of her punishment because of how vain she was. Below it, Perseus. He is the one that uh, was the victor of the queen of the Gorgons, Medusa. And if I'm going to give you a little pause here as to what was so famous about Medusa, a couple of things. One has to do with what was part of her makeup, so to speak. What was on top of her head? Snakes for hair. Pretty bad. Uh, the other was that if anybody saw her or if, you know, if she was able to look at you and you saw her, you would instantly turn into another dramatic pause here into stone. So I was trying to see if you could remember before I said it. So you would turn into stone. Perseus vanquished the, Gorg, uh, the queen Gorgon uh, of the Gorgons of uh, Medusa by not looking at her, but at her reflection in his shield and was able to vanquish her. And so that's part of the storyline. Right in between those two constellations, though, you see that little square. Um, okay, I'm behind the logo on YouTube, but that's okay. Um, the square is highlighting where the double cluster is. It is visible to the unaided eye just, uh, you know, in the night sky, if you have a dark sky. Binoculars, though, will show it in most any sky as long as it's clear. So binoculars in between the W of Cassiopeia and kind of the double hook shape of Perseus. And you'll see these two fuzzy spots. All right, so next picture. This picture I took about five, 10 minutes ago. And it wasn't a very long exposure, only a couple seconds, but it was just the difference between me being able to show you a live image and a captured image. There you can easily see the two clusters. An open cluster can be found in our in the plane of our galaxy. So um, Theo, is, uh, hopefully things will work out for her. She's gonna be showing you a spiral galaxy, a spiral arm galaxy called the Andromeda galaxy. And you're going to see these big spiral uh, disc uh, shape to it kind of like a pancake in space with a central bulge. And open clusters are found in that disk. And, and so that's what we don't typically find them high away from the uh, disk of the galaxy. They're kind of along the disk of our galaxies that we find them. And these two clusters um, are visible. In fact, let me show you, uh, tell you a little bit about it. Um, so they're along the Milky Way. They're also known as H and Chi Persei because they're officially in the uh, region of Perseus. Uh, they're both around 4.3, 4.4 magnitude. And so it's not, the limit of your vision at night for really dark skies is about six and a half magnitude. 4.3, um, modestly dark skies, you'd be able to just spot it. They're about 30 arc minutes wide. so half a degree. It's about the same visual size as the moon and the sun. There are about 350 total stars in these two clusters, about 7,000 light years away and easy in binoculars. Now I mentioned the term light years. Well, a light year is the distance tra light travels in a year. It's at 6 trillion miles. That's a six with 12 zeros after it. And, uh, um, so it's 7,000 of those away. So it takes 7,000 years for the light from that cluster, those two clusters to reach us. Um, let's see here. 
Okay, I'm going to show you one more picture. This is a photograph I took about four day, three to four days ago. And obviously a little bit longer exposure. A lot more stars can be seen. And you can really see the cluster uh, pattern itself very easily. But also it's in the Milky Way. So the sky, that whole picture is just filled with stars. Just to give you an idea about how large of a part of the sky that is, it's got, top and bottom is a little over two degrees of sky, left and right, a little over three degrees of sky. So that's a lot of sky. It's a very low magnification image but you can just see how nice the clusters are and how rich that star field is. Again, um, find them between Cassiopeia and Perseus. Look with binoculars. And that's now in the Northeast. You see that it's about 30 degrees up off the horizon right now after sunset uh, when it gets dark. So do try for that. Um, let me bring my picture back up and let's see, I see some questions. Okay, how many galaxies do we think there are? A lot. <laughs> uh, actually, uh, Theo's going to be talking about galaxies, but we don't know the true number. But to quote Carl Sagan, in the way he would say it, billions and billions. Um, it, there's just, we don't know how many there really are. There's just so many. And each galaxy has typically billions of stars. There are more stars out there than there are grains of sand on the entire Earth. And so that kind of gives you an idea about, right, I know it kind of blows your mind. Um, if you ever watched Cosmos with Carl Sagan uh, long ago, you, that's where that came from. And is there a name for the double cluster? The double cluster. That's the, truly, that is the name, the double cluster. The, and just to look at my notes, just to make sure. Um, they are also known as H. Persei and Chi Persei. And if you want to get detail, there's the new general catalog numbers of 869 and 884. Not as exciting as the double cluster, which is exactly how it looks. I'm going to stop right now and I guess give it back to Billy and then Theo. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much, Adam. Um, Theo, are you squared away over there? I think you're still muted. There we go. Yes, we are. We are good to go. All righty. So uh, let's go back up to uh, Goodlettsville in northern Davidson County to Theo Wellington, uh, who I mentioned before is a member of the BSAS, the Barnard Seaford Astronomical Society, as well as a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador. And uh, she's going to be talking to us about a galaxy tonight and also showing it to us. So Theo. So yay. Um, yeah, this is one of our showpiece objects, although it is and it isn't for reasons that we're going to make clear. It's, I think, one of the coolest things you can look at. But uh, let's see, I'm going to start a couple of slides here and then share that screen. So from current slide. And uh, sugar, I need to okay. get that down. Hang on. Okay, escape from that. So I need to make haul this over to here. Here we go. Now I can start that from current slide. There we go. And share screen. Does anybody else talk to themselves when they do this stuff? Okay. Share. Let's see if that works. Not that one. That's not who I want, actually. That's not who I want to share. I want to share this guy. And that's one. All right, we're kind of in the same area of sky as Adam was in, just a little moved over. Kill that. So if that goes away. And that's is that that's screen sharing, but it's not showing the slideshow, is it? There we go. So uh, 
in tonight's night sky, what I would look for is Mars, just because uh, it's big, it's bright, it's stupid easy to find. And so there it is, circled in our eastern sky. And then, uh, like he was talking about, there's a really prominent W of Cassiopeia. Um, if you can see a queen sitting in her chair in that, you're doing really well. Um, I just see it as a three, a W. You know, again, your imagination is your own. And then that great big square. And uh, again, there's lots of shapes you could make of with that. And every now and then I'd get a really pedantic teacher in the planetarium that would say that's not quite a square, but um, we call it the great square. And then I like to hop down one, two kind of bright stars from that corner of the square. And this works stupid well with binoculars, by the way. And then you hop up to not really bright stars, but in binoculars, they stand out really well. And you will not be able to help yourself. You're going to run across. And I was using the binoculars just a few minutes ago, actually, to help me point the telescope. You'll run across this fuzzy thing that looks like somebody stuck a piece of cotton ball up there in the sky. And when you really zoom in, you know, in pictures, it looks super cool. This is the kind of picture you often see on the back of a telescope box to try to sell you the telescope. And people will, you know, then ask us, why can't I see that? And the reason is your eye can't soak up light the way a camera does. That's a camera's view. What we actually see, and you can see this with just your eyes, especially here in the fall as it moves high, you know, by 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, it's pretty high up in the sky where it's a little bit darker. You can find this doing that star hop with just your eyes. Although if you try it first with binoculars, you'll find it and then you can find it with your eyes. But what we see with our eyes is just that bright central core. We don't see that whole extended piece. Now, if we could see that central core, it'd be stupid cool because that is actually over two times the width of the moon in the sky. So for example, here's the full moon rising over Nashville. Imagine if we could see that, that would be super cool. So Andromeda, it's a huge galaxy, okay, much like our own Milky Way. So, and we're neighbors. That's our nearest large neighbor galaxy in space. Well, we keep going back and forth about who's got more stars or who's got more mass, but we're both really big. We are members of what astronomers call our local group. It's our neighborhood of galaxies. Now, astronomers have weird ideas about what a neighborhood means. So it's over two and a half million light years away. So the light that you can see, and to me, this is what makes it cool, even when it's just a fuzzy dot, the light that you're seeing hitting your eyes when you look at it with just your eye or even through a telescope eyepiece has been traveling since our ancestors were walking around Africa. And I just find that to be super cool. You know, the light's taken all that time to get here and now it's finally here in your eye and you can see it. So roughly 1.2 billion solar masses of stars and stuff, maybe a trillion stars, okay? And it's a big galaxy, we're a big galaxy, and so we are actually coming toward each other and wait for it. You know, in a couple billion years, the view is going to be amazing. So let me see if I can turn that off and move instead to the actual camera view which I think approximates pretty well what you can see. I'm gonna move this over here. If you had your telescope out, I'm gonna share the screen now for the, here we go, fire capture. Share, share. All right. Can everybody see that? Because I can't see if I'm sharing. So that big, long, extended, fuzzy thing is what after an hour of nice, long exposure turns into that beautiful, beautiful galaxy. So it's kind of fun that, uh, yeah, we just got, can't see it with our eye, but it's still a very, very cool thing to look at in the night sky. So it's both a showpiece object, right? It's this huge, really cool spiral galaxy. And it's something that people go, but all I see is this little fuzzy patch. Yep, that's all you see. 
but it's cool when you know what it is. And this galaxy, you know, we used to have these huge discussions about were these nebulas that, because the first telescopes could only see it like this too. So was that outside? Was our Milky Way galaxy the entire universe and these things were just fuzzy bits inside it? Or were they more distant? And this wasn't settled until early in the last century when Edwin Hubble took a picture, or actually several pictures, and found a variable star that's in the Andromeda galaxy. And he could see that star's light waxing and waning in a regular manner. And those particular stars do that in a way that how long they take to wax and wane is related to their brightness. And we can find those stars really close to us and measure their, brightness, measure their distance with just trigonometry. So then we can use their brightness when we can't measure them that way to make a distance scale. And what he found was that this was, you know, hugely further out. All of a sudden our universe was huge. This was obviously outside the Milky Way and an island universe all unto itself. So that's what makes it stupid cool. And yeah, it's our nearest galaxy in the neighborhood. So we can wave, hi neighbor. And uh, it probably has a nice big black hole in the middle of it, just like we do as well. So does anybody have any questions? And somebody would have to relay those to me, I think, because I don't have the Zoom or the uh, chat open at the moment. Thank you, Theo. Um, so are M110 and M32 gravitationally bound to M31? Yes, those two little satellite galaxies. And they are much like our own Magellanic clouds. So, yep, they are going around it. And uh, yeah, gravity is fun and it works even on these incredibly huge distances. So someday there will be a collision and there will be a much larger elliptical galaxy out of all that. And people have dubbed that Milko media, which is kind of silly, but but long before that, maybe in a billion years, two billion years, the view is just going to get awesome as this thing gets closer and bigger and brighter in our sky. All right, anything All right. else? I think that is it for now, but we may get some more questions here in a little bit. All right. Thank you so much, Theo. That was really cool. Uh, so now we're actually going to go over to West Tennessee and visit with Jeremy Veldman. Uh, who is the president of the Memphis Astronomical Society. Um, he's actually uh, observing from the Sky Shed, which is the backyard observatory of Merrill Miller, who is another member of the Memphis Astronomical Society. And so tonight, Jeremy's going to be showing us a few deep sky objects, uh, namely uh, a, a galaxy and a, a type of nebula. So I'll turn it over to uh, Jeremy. Thank you very much, Billy. First of all, quick sound check. Can you give me the thumbs up if I'm all right? Excellent. Yeah, so doing something a little different tonight. I'm actually at my buddy Merrill's house. Merrill is a new member of the Memphis Astronomical Society, but he's been in the astrophotography space for years. And he's a retired engineer from Procter & Gamble, worked in Jackson, Tennessee for a, a good period of his career. In fact, if you like the snack food Pringles, at one point in time, he was he worked at the, the plant there and was, among other things, the, the world's largest distributor of, of the snack food Pringles. I find them highly addictive. You can't eat one or two. I usually can down a can pretty, pretty easily. So just a little fun fact there. But let me go ahead and share my screen and give you a better idea of where we are. So I'm going to go ahead and start from the beginning here. Um, so can everybody see that all right? Hopefully you can see the, the presentation. Um, hang on. Hang on one second. Let me stop the share because what it's doing is it's um, putting the PowerPoint presentation. Let me do this from the beginning and then I will uh, Okay. Yeah, just a second here. Let me end the show. All right. What I'm going to do is, I don't know if you guys can see this. I'm going to go ahead and share the screen again, and I'll just walk through the presentation. Oh, here we go. Let me do that. So can you guys see that all right?
Yep. Okay. All right. So this is the backyard of um, of Merrill Miller's house, and this is where we are tonight. And um, you can see here the view of the sky shed. When he built his house in 2011, he uh, actually laid the foundation for this sky shed. And of course, you know you've arrived in the world of astronomy when you have a, a backyard shed with a dome on it. And inside the dome is this telescope right here. This is a 14 inch Mead and it has an S big camera with adaptive op optics connected to it. And it's on an AP 1100M mount. So this is his rig for astrophotography and it is completely automated. So he not only has the hardware in place but all the software in place for doing imaging and it's completely automated. It's run by software. So he can literally set it up, run it, go to bed, and it will just image and get, gather data throughout the course of the night. And then he does all his post-processing after the fact. So, and then of course, here's where he controls it. This is where I am tonight. This is the actual control center. So, and we'll just kind of show you a few things here for what he does. Now, the first image we're gonna look at, the first target is the pinwheel galaxy. And this is Messier object M101. Now, this is a face-on spiral galaxy. You just saw the Andromeda galaxy. It's, it's, it's the closest major galaxy to the Milky Way. So we can see it relatively easily. In fact, it's naked eye visible from a dark sky site. Pinwheel galaxy, not so much. Because it's a face-on spiral, the surface brightness is much lower. So it's a really tough object to see. You have to be in really dark skies, big mirror to, to see it. And even then, it's a fuzzy patch but it's an excellent astrophotography target. Now, a little fact here about this galaxy. In 2011, a type 1a supernova was discovered in this galaxy. And a type 1a occurs when uh, a dense nugget called a white dwarf accretes matter from a nearby companion, in this case, a red giant. And when it accretes enough mass, it will undergo a thermonuclear runaway and detonate. And when that happens, for a brief moment, it outshines all of the stars in its galaxy. Type 1As are pretty rare. This is the closest Type 1A supernova ever discovered. It was only 21 million light years away. Now, that's inconceivably far away for some of the objects that we look at in our own Milky Way. But for galaxies, it's still relatively nearby. The significance of this discovery is... Um, that type 1a supernovas are a type of standard candle. And in the world of astronomy, they can be used to measure the expansion history of the universe. And this work was done in 1998, in the 1990s. And in 1998, it was the breakthrough discovery of all the sciences that year. And in fact, in the year 2011, these three men right here won the Nobel Prize. This is Saul Perlmutter, Adam Reese, and Brian Schmidt. We just talked about the Andromeda galaxy colliding with the Milky Way. It turns out that's not how the universe behaves on large scales. The universe is not only expanding, it's accelerating, it's speeding up, completely counterintuitive. So type 1As are very important objects. So now it's located, let me show you where it's located. If you can find the Big Dipper and the handle of the Big Dipper, it's actually right off the handle. So if you just draw a, um, an isosceles triangle, um, then that's where you find M101. It's, yeah, I guess an isosceles or an, an um, equilateral triangle. It's at the apex of that triangle. So it's a relatively easy target to find if you can find the, um, the, the Big Dipper. So I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing the PowerPoint here. And I'm gonna go ahead and share now my, my general screen so I can show you the program. So um, hang on. New share. Let me do. Um, okay, let me see if I can go to just a regular screen. Actually, let me go ahead and get out of this. Stop share. And then uh, I'm going to go ahead and exit this. Hang on just a second here. All right. Now I'll do a new share. Bring up the screen. Okay. So hopefully all you, everybody can see this. This is TeamViewer and this is the program. TeamViewer is just the view. 
That's the view, sorry. Maxim okay. DL. Maxim DL is the program that actually runs the observatory. I'm just gonna walk you through a couple of general steps. There's a lot of variables here in the process. Um, but um, you got the, uh, the first step in the process is to find a focus star because when you're doing astro imaging, you wanna make sure that the telescope can track that object because you're gonna be taking longer exposures and then stacking them later. So the first step is to find a focus star, do the initial focus and calibration. And that's what's done here in the SBAG AO control window. Once that's done, then you're essentially set to do your plate solving and then you can start doing your imaging. I'm not gonna do that for M101. I'll show you a little bit of how the process works when we go to the second object, which is the Cocoon Nebula. But um, we took a couple of subs uh, a little earlier of the um, of M101, the Pinwheel Galaxy, and I just wanna show you what those look like. So typically in the world of astrophotography, you wanna be doing at least five minute, what are called subs. And a sub is just like one exposure or one image. So if you um, set your, tr your telescope and assuming everything is calibrated right and it's tracking, you get a five minute exposure, you do multiple exposures, sometimes for several hours, sometimes even several days, and then you do the, the, the post stacking later. We're only gonna show you the luminance data tonight. So in other words, um, there's several different types of exposures you take, which is uh, the luminance data, but then not, you, know, you may go back and do something like hydrogen alpha and, and other filters. RGB. So this is the RGB data. So here's what a, whoops, that's the, uh, we'll get that in just a second. Here's what a five minute exposure of the pinwheel galaxy looks like. Now in a telescope, you would see a fuzzy patch. Here you can start to see a little bit of structure. You can see the bright nucleus, which is typically what you see with a galaxy. And the nice thing about an astrophotography target is you can actually start to see some of the arm structure coming out from the pinwheel galaxy. Now here's a 12 hour integrated exposure. So in other words, 12 hours worth of data, each one of these subs is five minutes long and then you stack them. So you can see here a lot more detail coming out, including the bright nucleus. I mean, at the center of this galaxy, if you were on a planet orbiting a star near the center of this galaxy, it would be so bright that you would literally, it would be like daylight 24 hours a day. That's how, that's how dense the, the, the star is near the nucleus of, the, of this galaxy. So this is what a 12 hours worth of data looks like. And then the final image is, um, this is act, act, actually several, several hours and several days, and then also all the data stacked together. And here you can really see the richness of this target. So um, the, the full arm structure. And then of course, the one thing that's really fascinating about spiral galaxies, is you get that density wave that propagates through the stars. And in the arm, you know, the arm structure is where the arms of the galaxy is where all the action occurs. That's where the, the, uh, the, high, the H2 regions tend to condense and form stars. And that's why what you're really seeing here is the brighter O and B type stars, that, uh, which is where most of the light from a, a spiral galaxy occurs. So that's M101. Now the second target, and let me go ahead and get back to my PowerPoint here. So I'm gonna go in the screen share one last time. Uh, let me bring up my PowerPoint here. Um, hang on. Okay. So hopefully I can get this here. Um, nope. Things are, bear with me one second here. I want to show you the cocoon. Um, current. All right, here we go. Now, let me see if I can share. Um, see if you guys can see that. There we go. All right. So the, the second object is the Cocoon Nebula. Now, Merrill's been working on this one for a little while. Similar to what we saw last time with the Trifid Nebula, this is a stellar nursery where new stars are forming. And it's an emission nebula. And again, an emission nebula occurs when you have excited ionized hydrogen gas, and then when the electron jumps from the third energy level to the second energy level, it emits this red light. So that's where you get this characteristic um, pink and uh, reddish color. And in this case, the star at the center of this nebula is BD 
46, 34, 74, that's actually causing this phenomenon to occur. It's a very, very hot B type star, 30,000 degrees. So let me go ahead and get back to the software here. And um, let me go ahead and get out of that and show you what this, okay. So we're gonna go to, we're gonna go back to, uh, to our program here. I'm gonna actually show you the process of the telescope slewing to the target. There you go. All right. So everything is set up. We've done our, our focus star. Um, we've done our plate solving. So now all I got to do, and everything is already lined up here in the program. CCD Commander is the program that Merrill uses to do his astro imaging. So if I hit the play button, here's the actual process of the telescope slewing to the target. Is it slowing? Yeah, there it goes. There it goes. All right. So it's moving. You can see the telescope moving and then uh, the dome, the slit of the dome is open and it's moving. Okay, there, the, there goes the dome, it's actually moving. So it's going to find the, um, the cocoon nebula, which is the second image or the, the second target that we're looking at tonight. And there you can see it actually moving to the target. And then we'll go back to, uh, back to our program. And uh, again, we've got maximum DL working. working and you can actually see it running, right? It's doing the plate solve. So it's doing the plate solve right now. And now we are ready to start imaging. X that, X that one out. Which one, this one? No, no, no. This one? Yeah. All right, so X that one out. See, it found the guide star. So it found the guide star, and now it's actually in the process of imaging it, correct? Well, as soon as, as, soon as it starts tracking. Oh, it'll, as soon as it starts tracking. So here's the window that we're gonna be looking at to see it actually start tracking, correct? Yep. Like All right. Oh, there it, there it is. There's our guide star. So now we just go to track and now it's actually tracking. It's, it's running. So that's it. So now he can actually image. Now we can just go to bed and the process will be automatic because it's already set up. And every once in a while, he'll get up in the middle of the night and just make sure that this star is actually in the middle of the window. And he'll take what? Several hours worth of data throughout the course of the night and then uh, stack them later. So that's pretty much it. So show the Pix Insight. Pix Insight. Oh yeah, the Pix Insight. So let's let's look at the actual finished product. Here's a five minute, again sub of the Cocoon Nebula, and here again you can see some of the structure here, the emission part of the nebula and these dark lanes right here. That's the dark part of the nebula. So regions of dust within the uh, the nebula itself that are obscuring light from coming through. So that's a five minute exposure. And then here is a seven hour exposure, quite a bit more detail that you can actually see in here. And you can see, you can notice the stars are nice and round and crisp, meaning the calibration was, was set up correctly. And then the final finished product here is one that he worked on. And this is a really beautiful image. So again, you can see the, the luminance, the full color, mostly the red again, because of the hydrogen alpha emission. You can also see some of the blue, which is ind indicative of oxygen. And then of course the dark lanes right here, which is a dark nebula. So it's really a combination of emission, dark and reflection nebula. So this is the cocoon nebula, final product, several hours worth of data and then also stacking. So that's pretty much it. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and stop share now and see if anybody has any questions. So we did have a, a couple of questions. Um, one of them was, why did, so if you go back to the, the really nice image of the pinwheel, why did the two stars have rays coming out of this blue box? Let me see, where is that? Is that the final one? They're called refraction spikes. Oh, okay. Yeah, those are refraction spikes from the stars. That's all, that's all that that's is. Yeah, that's just for looks. That's all that is. That's not, um, it's not actual, any, any natural phenomenon, just an imaging phenomenon. Uh, let's see. And there was one other question. Um, this, this one might be more for the end, but uh, where are we likely to find habitable planets? So I think, um, you know, anybody. Yeah. Here that, you, know, please you don't want to. Yeah, that's an interesting question. So the general principle in a spiral galaxy, first, you want to be you. Um, you don't want to be too close to the center of the galaxy because that's that's typically where the O and B type stars are located and they just spew off massive amounts of radiation, which would probably obliterate any life if it was getting started on a world. 
you don't want to be too far out either because you want to be you want to be in the, the galactic habitable zone where you have stars that aren't going to kill you, but also enough richness of elements so that um, you can form structure, specifically metals. So just like there's a habitable zone around stars, there's also a galactic habitable zone where you're more likely to find stars that have the potential for, for um, you know, Earth-like planets. So, you know, KG and G type stars are probably your best bet. Okay. Oh, and I had one question. Um, so you had mentioned plate solving. Could you explain what plate solving means? I'm going to refer, defer to <laughs> my man, Merrill. Well, there, somebody over time has created a catalog where the exact RA and deck of all the stars are, and you take an image and you just compare that to that category, the catalog. And once you, their exact matches, you know exactly where you're pointing. So that's what's very important to telescope probably as important as anything is that you can point to where you want to point. Mm -hmm. So basically what you're doing is you'll take your first image through your telescope. The computer will then try to match that to yep. an area that's around where you're supposed to be and say, oh, we're actually looking at this little section based on where I see stars that match up perfectly with these stars. So maybe I need to move the telescope down just to tell Well, what the process is once you know where you are, you just sync the telescope to that location. Mm -hmm. So it's precise. Uh, so you can point anywhere else in the sky and you'll be where you want to be. But then the plate solving basically tells the, or allows the telescope to say, okay, I know exactly where I'm pointing now. Correct. If I need to move a little bit now, I know where I'm going to have to move to. That's correct. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. There was one other here. What mortal zone is Merrill in? And does he find himself having to use DBE and PixInsight? What Bortle sky? I think we're Bortle. Is it three? Um, three, three, probably. You know, if you look at the, uh, I guess it's a green zone. We're in a green zone. I think it's yellow. Oh, yellow yeah, zone. It's yellow. We're in a oh. yellow zone. Could you uh, explain a little bit? What the, I'm sorry. Uh, could you explain just a little bit what's meant by Bortle zone? <laughs> yeah. Um, I believe gray is the best. I gotta, I've got to refresh my memory on this. And then there's blue, and then I think there's green or yellow, and then green. So yellow is like three, third or fourth best. So you got, you still, you know, dark enough where you can see the Milky Way, but you still get some light domes on the horizon. I've got to, I've got to brush up on the Bortle scale, scale too. So if somebody else knows, knows more, feel free to pipe in. But yeah, I think we're yellow. Um, we're certainly not Bortle one or two. Um, I think we're probably four right here. So, so it, oh, yeah. Basically referring to how bright the sky is, correct? So correct. if we're in like a, a gray area then, or a, a very dark blue area, then you would be in essentially very, very dark skies. But around a city, our, the Bortle map would look very orangey red because there's so many lights in the city making it very hard to see, right? Exactly. We're in a yellow zone just outside of the metro area of Memphis, so. Gotcha. Yeah. Did I hear somebody ask about the DB and fix that inside? Yes. What was the question about it? Um, so let's see. Does he find? Does Merrill find himself having to use DBE in picks insight? On, on all images, yes. Yeah, on all images. Uh, you want to give a little info as to what it's that just, is? It just it's dynamic background equalization, I believe, is the DBE. And it just basically flattens the, the background and makes it smooth. Because yeah. it's, just, it's just a tool and picks insight. OK. All right. Well, I think that that is all the questions we have at the moment. So with that, um, anything else, Jeremy, before we move on? That'll do it. Appreciate right. it. Thank you very much. Thanks. All righty. So now we are going to head uh, back over to Middle Tennessee, we're actually going to be uh, just a little bit southeast of Nashville, near Murfreesboro. Uh, we're going to join John Kramer, who's in Christiana, Tennessee. Uh, John is also a member of the Barnard Seaford Astronomical Society, and um, he enjoys uh, sharing his love of the night sky live uh, by broadcasting to sites such as the Night Skies Network. And he's even got his own YouTube channel called At The Eyepiece. So I'd recommend that you all go check out his uh, YouTube channel. It's a lot of great info on there. So uh, he's going to uh, talk to us about another galaxy tonight. So John? 
Well, hello there, everyone. Give me a quick thumbs up if my audio is good, please, if uh, the group doesn't mind. Awesome. Thank you very much. So, yes, I am broadcasting uh, right from my little backyard observatory. Got the telescope about, uh, oh, 15 feet or so away. And tonight you've been seeing some different galaxies, and that's cool because galaxies are, are awesome right? I uh, love galaxies, and they're really fascinating to go ahead and show. And the one that I've got lined up for you here is Messier 33, M33. Now, there's some really cool things about this galaxy, but before I start talking about it, well, let, let's go ahead and take a peek at the galaxy itself. So here is our live view. Well, I say live. Now, remember, Merrill. God bless them, 18 hours of integration on, on a particular object. I don't have that type of patience. <laughs> but this is 18 minutes of one minute exposures and it's stacked. And that's how we're able to go ahead and see uh, this beautiful uh, spiral galaxy again, M33. Now we're able to go ahead and pick out some of the spiral structure let me just go ahead and use, you can see here some of the arms spiraling out and some of the other ones here, maybe another area here. So that's why it's a spiral. It's almost face on. I don't believe it's a full face on galaxy, uh, meaning completely perpendicular to us, but we're able to pick up that spiral structure fairly quickly in the telescopic view here tonight. So I'm very, very thankful for that. And if you were going to go ahead outside, um, keep in mind that this is a galaxy. They're generally, well, they're, they're dim, but in the realm of galaxies, this one actually is, is rather bright. Um, this is just a little bit fainter than the galaxy that uh, Theo was showing earlier, M31. And it's actually in the same... Um, group we we call it i believe it's the local group of galaxies and that just means that they're uh within our local neighborhood you know you got m well you got the milky way galaxy which is of course our galaxy and then you have m31 and then you have here m33 so a couple of interesting facts about m33 here is that you know i said it's already it's bright relatively bright for a galaxy, but it's still very challenging for you to see. You have to go ahead and be outside in a very dark sky site um, with exceptionally good clarity for that evening. And you have to have some pretty darn good eyesight in order to be able to nab M33 for yourself. But if you were able to do that, one of the cool things is you would be seeing the furthest object that you can see from Earth with M33 without using optical aid. So how cool is that? So that's kind of a challenge to throw out there for folks to spot not only the M31 that we were showing earlier, but hey, why not go for M33 if you have a a pretty good uh, sky in order to do that. So let's go ahead and flip our view over to Stellarium. This is a free product that I highly recommend. Um, it's, a, it's a planetarium program. It shows us where we are in the night sky, et cetera. So I am gonna go ahead and try to help you all locate M33 uh, for yourself. So you can see we're pointed just about here. So if we were to go outside and if you were to look towards your east, you would go ahead and see not only Mars, which is right here, uh, but you would start to pick up the large square of Pegasus here, pretty prominent. Now, to locate our M33, you're going to have to follow a few stars and find a little bit of a dimmer constellation. So let me zoom in here just a bit. And I would say First, start off at the tip star here on the corner of the large square of Pegasus called Alpha Rats, and then kind of hop down towards 
my rack. And from here, look further, look lower towards the east, and you should be able to see a very dim constellation called Triangulum. And that, by the way, M33 is actually called the Triangulum Galaxy. Interestingly enough as well, you just had, uh, I think we were showing a, a previous galaxy, the pinwheel. Sometimes those those uh, get actually confusing. So for the purpose of tonight, I'm just going to refer to this as M33 because it's actually sometimes referenced as the pinwheel as well. But uh, if you were to find, oops, if you were to find Merak right here, and then the tip of the point of the triangulum constellation here, that tip star is called Moth Allah. And I would say about one third of the distance north of that, you might be able to spot M33. That's where we are looking. So a couple of other interesting points here on M33. Let's go back to our live view because, hey, you know, that's that's the cool part. I, I am not stacking at the moment, but that's why those messages keep popping up. But we have 18 uh, stacks so far. We, we can do here. This is live. I'll take a chance. Remember the beautiful view that we have here because we're doing this live. So if something happens, well, it might, it might mess it up, but we'll leave it going as is right here uh, with M33. So a couple of other interesting points about it. Um, it was one of the first objects that uh, the Earl of Rose uh, defined as a um, spiral nebula. You know, they didn't even know these things were galaxies, um, but also Hubble, uh, that dude, uh, Edwin Hubble, studied CFID variable stars in M33 to go ahead and, and um, determine that these things were not in our own galaxy. They were completely separate galaxies themselves. So I thought that was a really interesting point. And, you know, Charles Messier, he's the gentleman that created all of these uh, objects, well, not all of these objects, but created a very cool list that as amateur astronomers we go through. He first added this object to his um, list back in 1764. So very, very cool there. Now, as we go ahead and we view this particular object, just because of the nature of M33, I, we kind of pointed out the spiral arms there. Hopefully this is coming through okay. All right, but one of the things here, so I can pick out a really nice spiral arm here as we go through the core. We have another nice one here, but right at the end of that spiral is another really cool feature, not uh, a very prominent feature of M33. It's a hydrogen two region. In fact, it's one of the largest hydrogen two regions uh, in a galaxy itself. And if you had a large enough telescope uh, and you were outside visually trying to scrutinize this um, uh, object yourself at the eyepiece, you might be able to just pick up the fuzzy area there uh, for yourself. That's actually so prominent that it has its own catalog number, an NGC number. That stands for, I think it's New General Catalog of uh, six, yeah, six zero four. So very, very uh, prominent region. And, and you can see, let me go back to my other program so that I can kind of highlight these. Let me get rid of those blue bars here for you. There we go. Um, bring that back up maybe and remove it. Okay, there we go. You got a couple of more, not quite as prominent, but there's, you know, we got one, um, we got one here. Let's see what happened. Move this over. That box got moved. We've got one right here just to the south. I'm not sure why that's not moving around on me like that. Well, anyway, you do have a couple of other visible hydrogen 
two locations within the galaxy. It's those red areas that are very, very prominent. Hopefully it's coming through on the stream pretty well. And interestingly enough, you also have some bluish regions, which would represent um, younger uh, star activity. The, the red would be more of, I think, an older hydrogen region, and, and blue, would, blue would represent more uh, younger star uh, activity being created um, in Messier 33. So that is our view here for M33 tonight. We got any other, uh, we got some questions or if we're ready for the next person, that was my spiel. All right, well, thank you very much, John. Um, it doesn't look like we have any questions at the moment, but you know, we may get some at the very end there. So with that, thank you again. That was a really cool view of M33. Um, so we're gonna head back over to Theo Wellington uh, up in just a little bit north of Nashville. And instead of looking at a galaxy this time, we're going to look at a single object um, that resides within our own galaxy. Well, actually, hold on uh, one second, Theo, um, if you wouldn't mind. Um, we actually do have a question. Uh, so, John, uh, why do younger stars look blue and older stars look red? Now, you all told me that there would not be a test on this broadcast. Uh, Please. Let's see. There, there's a, there's a, something called the HR diagram, Herzl Russell. Is that if one of the other amateurs or one of the other professionals out there know? Uh, but basically, a blue star is younger and hotter than the older red star. It's it's younger in its life period, basically. So in the red stars, they've kind of, you know, gone through their older. They've kind of burned through their hydrogen and they're burning other heavier materials now, which in turn cools them down more. So, so that's why they're a, a different color um, than say the blue stars, which are hotter. And I'll just add to that. Um, so to be a blue star, you have to be a very massive star. Uh, and so very massive stars get very hot, which gives them their blue color. And the more massive a star is, the shorter it lives. So some of the most massive stars may live less than a million years, whereas a star like our sun will live about 10 billion years. And then these little bitty red dwarf stars, they may live as much as about a trillion years. Um, and so these very hot massive stars, as uh, John was saying, when they begin to evolve and they start uh, fusing other elements within them, they start swelling up and cooling off. And so um, they, the only blue stars are really these very large, massive stars. And so those stars are not going to live for, again, a very long time. So we know that if a star is very blue, it's not been around for very long. So we could still basically consider it young, whereas some of the very oldest stars or even some of the older stars are going to be very red in color. So just a little addition to that. All right, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, John. And so now we're going to go back up to Thea Wellington. And um, as I mentioned before, she's going to be checking out something that resides within our own galaxy instead of looking at another galaxy. All right. So we're going to be looking at an object that a lot of people are familiar with from Hubble images. It's called the Cat's Eye Nebula. And we've looked at some of these in the past. It's um, Artistically, you would say it's it's the death shroud of a, of a sun-like star. When sun-like stars evolve, like we were talking about, they get to a phase where they're kind of blowing off layers of their atmosphere. And then later in their life, when they just don't have anything else to fuse, they shrink down to a white dwarf. They can't do fusion anymore, but when you shrink, you get hot too. So they give off a lot of ultraviolet radiation, which lights up these shells that were previously expelled. And then depending on the exact geometry of these shells or the angle that we're seeing them at, they're all unique and different and fun. So it's kind of interesting. They're very beautiful objects. They're very short lived because they only are lit for as long as that white dwarf has enough energy to do that, which is maybe on the order of a few tens of thousands of years. So they're beautiful and ephemeral as well. So uh, let's see, I'm gonna go to 
So let's see, I'm going to share what you can see. All right, there we go. Share that guy. So uh, that's what, uh, what the Hubble sees. And that's kind of a pretty image. I mean, it's got lots of detail. So you can see that there were lots of cool things going on at some point in that star's lifetime. Um, let's see if I have to go over here. Hang on. Click this. Click down. There we go. Um, that's a combination of Hubble imagery with X-ray imagery. So things that are hot and shining in the ultraviolet, they also a lot of times are good for X-rays. So that's combined with Chandra X-ray data as well. And uh, so it's, it's very, very cool. And if you really soak it, that so that inner part there is what we've been looking at. But there is an extended outer shell that we really have trouble. That's a super long exposure to get that. So that's not what we usually see. So entertainingly enough, this is often called um, the Countdown uh, Nebula because uh, its NGC number is 6543. So it's easy to remember, too. Um, that new general catalog, by the way, new, again, astronomers have funny ideas about stuff. It was new in 1888. So, but, you know, astronomy has been going on for thousands of years. So let's see if we can share the view of what it actually looks like. Let's see that screen. Ah, come on. Get my mouse tamed down here. Here we go. Share. All right. All right, hopefully you guys can see that. So that cute little bluish and reddish thing, that's that cat's eye nebula. And uh, that's actually not too bad. We were pretty happy with this tonight. It's, uh, it's not very large. And those are actually only two second exposures. So if your eye was at the eyepiece, you would see this. You know, it, it would just be this cute little faint bluish thing. And uh, to do this, to get this view, we're using a, a kind of uh, over large telescope. Um, the last object I did, the Andromeda Galaxy, I actually needed a wide field of view because it's so big. And so for that, I had a refractor that has a fairly short focal length. When you want to look at something that's kind of tiny, you want something with a really long focal length. So maybe we can get this in the field of view or I can get some pictures later, but um, we're using a 20 inch uh, Dobsonian telescope. So it's simple in design, but it's kind of large, <laughs> but it's a lot of fun. And we do bring it to star parties when we get the chance. So this is our view tonight of the uh, cat's eye nebula. And uh, you know, maybe it does look a bit like a cat's eye here. You can kind of make that out a little bit. So that's kind of fun. But it's, uh, like I said, it's a planetary nebula. They called them planetary nebulas because they're kind of sort of round and they reminded somebody of planets. So this is one of those rare things, I think, in astronomy that just has an awful, terrible name because there's nothing like about them that's a planet. But they're called planetary nebulae, mostly for their shape. So there's only a few things like that. I think most things we named pretty well, you know, place where there's no light coming out. Looks like a hole and it's black. It's a black hole spot on the sun. It's a sunspot. So most stuff is well named, but planetary nebulae not so much but uh this was our first uh first time trying out this telescope with this camera so we were happy just to make it work actually so anybody have any fun questions about these this is again one of the brighter ones so it's a good object for a backyard telescope um, actually, Theo, would you mind talking about what you see as the very bright spot right in the center of that? Ah, uh, that's a good question. Hopefully that's the central star, um, which again is a white dwarf. I'm not sure how well focused we are. Let's see. Yeah, that's probably it. So white dwarfs are stars at the very end of their lives and they're small, well, not relatively small, but stars like the sun end up like this. They lose mass in their red giant stage, casting off all these layers that are now beautifully illuminated. And then once they finally can't fuse things anymore, they just start shrinking. They can't hold themselves up anymore. They're not making energy. So they just generally shrink down. 
It takes a long, long, long time to cool off a star though. So, you know, it'll get dimmer gradually over time, but it takes billions and billions and billions of years to completely cool off a white dwarf. I mean, eventually it'll go dark, but that will take a very long time. So, but they're, they're nice, pretty little stars. Now, sometimes they're by themselves like our sun is. And so they just get to live their lives and die. Sometimes though, they're companions to other stars. And if they go through their evolution first, and they're a little white dwarf sitting there just trying to cool off, but the other star now swells up in its red giant stage and they're close enough so that the other guy starts dumping matter onto the white dwarf. That's not stable. So eventually a huge case of indigestion occurs and the stuff that's dumped on the white dwarf flashes off and sometimes the whole thing goes kaboom at that point. You have too much mass, things start happening and you get a giant nova, you get a supernova. And because that happens for white dwarfs at a particular mass, they're all kind of the same exact brightness when they do that. So that's been another one of our fun distance candles to use in the universe. When we see a white dwarf supernova, we know that about how far away it is by how bright we're seeing it. So that's kind of a, a fun fact too. They've been used to scale the universe and it's studying these kinds of supernovae because they're thought of as standard candles um, that they have been used to show that the universe's expansion is not steady or not slowing down, but actually appears to be accelerating. So they're kind of boring. You know, you think of a white dwarf just sitting there cooling off as being kind of boring, but actually they're kind of interesting and, and we've used them in a fun way. But their nebulae at this phase are just really pretty things to look at. All right, well, thank you very much, Theo. Um, I just wanted to add to it that that little white dwarf that we're seeing in there, um, that, you know, it looks large and that nebula is probably about a light year across. And so it looks like that white dwarf would actually be humongous. But light, when it goes through a telescope, doesn't matter what kind of telescope you have, just because of the, the properties of light itself, light spreads out. And so the actual physical size of that white dwarf is many, many times smaller than a single pixel in that camera. Yep. But because of the light spreading um, that goes on, it's called the, uh, the uh, point spread function, if you want the technical term for that. Um, that makes it look bigger. But what we're actually seeing is an object that's about maybe half as massive as the sun, but it's physically only about the diameter of the earth. So um, it's very small, it's very hot, but that makes it very faint. But I do want to say that this is, um, you can actually see that white dwarf in this nebula. I remember the first time I saw this nebula uh, through a, a moderate sized telescope. And the first thing that struck me was actually getting to see that white dwarf. When you look at some of these other planetary nebula like the ring nebula, which we've seen before, or the dumbbell nebula, those are planetary nebulae as well, but you can't really see the white dwarf except for those long exposure images, so. Yep. Um, and is, is about, over 3,300 light years out too. So it's not super close, but yeah, it's, it's nice and bright. But still with the easily within our galaxy. Yes. Um, well, there was one other question. How do you locate the Cat's Eye Nebula? Which constellation is it in? It's in Draco, uh, the dragon, which is a cool little constellation that winds between the big and little dippers. Um, this is sort of towards the end of the tail, if you like. So it's a little higher than the, than the little dipper at the moment. Um, how do you locate it? Well, it depends. If you've got uh, a telescope that's got the cute little, hey, I want to go to NGC 6543, go, then it goes. Um, otherwise, what you do is you get out a great program like what John's been uh, showing you, Stellarium, which is wonderful, and you start star hopping. So you find a pattern of bright stars, and then maybe using binoculars, you start, okay, there's that pattern, then I move to this one and this one and this one. And you can actually get to objects like this and be really tiny and faint in binoculars. But that's how you can do things in a telescope, even without the uh, fancy computer functions. And, and it's surprising how easily you can make little charts that basically, OK, I'm going to move this far in this direction to this star. And you can hop along and then find these things. So uh, okay. it's, it's a challenge. And it's a fun way to really learn the sky and get good with your instrument to do that also. Um, I see as well, what camera are you using? This is a cute little 
um, color camera, it's usually used as a guide scope. It has a tiny, tiny little chip, um, which is what made this a challenge. It's called a QHY, I think the 5-2C. And it's just a can because it's really just a little cylinder with a chip because we don't need the whole rest of a camera for doing this kind of stuff. We just need the chip. So that's literally the, the camera chip in a can and then it's you know got an out to go to the computer. So it's um, this is a relatively inexpensive camera. Like I said, usually I don't use it for photography per se. It doesn't have that many pixels, but it's good for a guide scope. And what a guide scope does for you is you can tell it uh, say one of the faint stars down there, you'd say, hey, um, keep the telescope on that, in that star in that place. And it will then uh, work through the mount to issue commands to say, okay, I'm going to hold it there. And that lets you take long exposures where nobody moves. You know, you don't get star trailing and things like that. So it's a nice little camera and uh, it's, it's doing a pretty decent job for us tonight. All right. Well, thank you so much, Theo. All righty, uh, so I guess the, the program goes back to me for just a moment. Um, so we've got another object we're going to check out. So we've been looking at a lot of um, deep sky objects like galaxies and some star clusters and then some planetary nebula as uh, Theo just showed us. But we're going to go back into our solar system and check out another object which we haven't actually seen before on our program. So let me do a quick screen share. And there we go. So this image doesn't look quite as colorful as a lot of the images that uh, we've been seeing of galaxies and the planetary nebulae and the clusters. But uh, personally, I think this is a, a really neat image. So you'll see up here in the top left of my screen that we've got about a three second exposure going. And you can definitely tell that there is a little bit of blue color to this. So this is not Uranus, but this is actually the planet Neptune. So Neptune uh, is about 30 times farther out from the sun than uh, the Earth is. Uh, but if you have uh, even a small telescope, you can actually spot this. Um, it's a little bit too faint to be seen just by the eye. If you have a good pair of binoculars and you know where to look, especially if you have a good star map, you could actually uh, pick this out. So Neptune wasn't known since antiquity like uh, the planets uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, because all of those planets could actually be seen naked eye. Uh, Uranus was a little bit uh, too dim to be seen by eye, um, and because it, it well, it, it's right at the limit of naked eye visibility, but because it moves so slowly through the stars, um, or among the background stars, we don't really notice it moving every year, so it wasn't discovered until about uh, uh, early part of the 1800s. Uh, Neptune was actually first figured out to uh, likely exist because of mathematics. Um, so as I mentioned before, Johannes Kepler had devised three laws of planetary motion, and then uh, Sir Isaac Newton expanded upon that to, uh, to formulate his uh, universal law of gravitation, which we could then use to really accurately predict how planets would move and where they should be at certain times. And so after uh, many uh, years of observing uh, uh, Uranus, about 30 to 40 years of observing Uranus, astronomers noted that Uranus wasn't quite following where uh, it should be. And so it was thought that maybe there was another planet whose gravity was actually pulling on Uranus and causing its uh, apparent position to deviate just a little bit from what was predicted. And so uh, two, uh, uh, Two astronomers had independently um, uh, had predicted where this planet ought to be before it was actually found through a telescope, but it was actually uh, found where it was predicted to be. So that was back in 1846. Um, in 2011, we actually just uh, celebrated Neptune's birthday, which is um, the time since its discovery back in 1846, and it takes 165 years to orbit the sun. It had made exactly one orbit since its discovery. So it'll be another about 100 and, and let's see here, 65, about another 156 years before we have another one of Neptune's birthdays. But anyway, um, in a, a moderate sized telescope, you can definitely tell that this does have a little ball structure. 
Um, now, as we'll see, Neptune is bigger than the Earth. In fact, um, all of the gas giants and the ice giants are larger than the Earth, both diameter and mass. Now, before we leave our live view for you, me to show you a couple of slides, I want to bring up the exposure just a little bit. So well, let me rephrase that. I'm going to bring up the gain. So I'm going to basically amplify my signal um, in the program to try to make the fainter things brighter. So I'm going to bring it up quite a bit. And then boom, right there, about five o'clock position of Neptune. We have this other little dot there. And you'll notice that as the atmosphere is shifting and we get our new exposure in, Neptune looks like it's bouncing around a little bit as well. And its little companion is doing the same thing. That is actually its largest moon, Triton. Uh, so Neptune, as far as we know, has at least 14 moons. Um, it will likely be that other moons are discovered, especially if we send other missions out to visit Neptune. Uh, but this is by far its largest moon, just a little bit smaller uh, than our own moon. And uh, Triton, not to be confused with Saturn's Titan, is a pretty interesting object. And I'll show you some, some images of that in, in just a moment. Uh, now likely next month or the month after that, uh, when Uranus gets up higher, we'll take a look at Uranus and you'll see um, that it looks a little bit larger in our view because it's closer to us than what, uh, than what Neptune is. So uh, let me pull up just a couple of slides here uh, and give you just a, a quick lowdown about Neptune. Actually, let me start my, my slideshow. Give me one second. Uh, slide. All right. And so Theo, you're not the only one that talks to themselves while they do this. So. All right, so now we should be able to see uh, Neptune. I think I am one slide too far. All right, can everybody see Neptune and the Earth there? All right, cool, thank you. So here is a scale comparison of our Earth uh, and Moon versus Triton and Neptune. So Earth is about four times smaller in diameter. Um, Neptune is about 17 times as massive as the Earth. But as you can see, our Moon is about four times smaller than our Earth. Triton is just a, a little bit behind that. So we've only visited Neptune one time, and that was back in 1989 when Voyager 2 uh, did a flyby of the planet. So it didn't go into orbit around Neptune, stay there for a little while, uh, taking images and really studying Neptune, its moons, and as we'll see, its rings. Uh, it actually just passed right on by, but as it was passing by, it was quickly snapping images, taking as much data as it possibly could. And so we learned a lot about Neptune and its moons and its rings um, during that flyby. So hopefully in the coming years, we will have another mission that will head out to the outer solar system to visit Uranus and Neptune, both for a um, a second time. So as it turns out, the reason that we visited Neptune in, in the first place uh, was that back in the, um, in the late 70s, uh, when the Voyager missions were, were being constructed, it turns out that the planets Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune were, in, were coming into a, a good position within our solar system so that if we were to send one of the Voyager probes to Jupiter, we could do a flyby of Jupiter and use Jupiter's gravity to help send us on to Saturn. And then once we got to Saturn, we could use Saturn to then help send us on to Neptune, or excuse me, to Uranus. And then we do the same thing once we get to Uranus, we head on to, uh, to Neptune. So Pluto wasn't uh, in, in that line as well. Otherwise, we would, hopefully it would have visited uh, Pluto back then. So that, that uh, alignment doesn't uh, occur very often. It's only once about every 175 years, if I remember correctly. But anyway, we did get to visit Neptune uh, and uh, we got some really great views of it. So um, Neptune has some interesting features on it or had some interesting features anyway. Um, so these are individual images taken by uh, Voyager 2 mission as it was going by uh, Neptune. And so those were combined into a movie and so you see that there's one very prominent feature that went right through here. 
And unfortunately, my movie is having a little bit of an issue. But that dark region that you're seeing right there, that is known as Neptune's great dark spot. So if you think back to Jupiter, Jupiter had that massive storm that we call the Great Red Spot, which has been observed for uh, at least a, a few hundred years. Uh, the Great Dark Spot on Neptune uh, looks like that was a much more short-lived storm. Uh, first time we saw it was when, um, when Voyager 2 passed by. And then uh, when the Hubble Space Telescope was launched uh, back in 1990 and the first observations of Neptune were made, was found that that great dark spot had disappeared. But then in subsequent years, other versions of the great, uh, the great dark spot had emerged. So uh, Neptune has a number of moons, uh, has 14 of them as, we, as far as we know, or at least 14, I should say. Um, as you can see in our view here, uh, there was one discovered back in 2004 this is, wasn't from a flyby of the planet, but actually from um, uh, a long exposure image from a telescope here at the Earth. Um, but you see how some of these uh, moons are in orbit around Neptune. And so Neptune would rotate. Uh, if we viewed it from above, it would rotate counterclockwise, just like all the other planets do. It would orbit counterclockwise around the sun, again, if viewed from above. And the moons that are in orbit around Neptune all do the same thing except for that one interesting moon that we just uh, highlighted earlier. So Triton, which is the largest of those uh, 14 known moons, um, it is in what we call a retrograde orbit. So um, it doesn't orbit in the same direction around uh, Neptune as the rest of the moons, which is the same direction that Neptune rotates. Um, the, what we call the regular moons of Neptune, they orbit in the same direction, they have pretty circular orbits around Neptune, and they orbit basically around the equator, which suggests that they likely formed around Neptune. But Triton, it goes in the opposite direction. It's in what we call a retrograde orbit. Um, its orbit is also inclined as well. So it likely did not form around Neptune. In fact, it, um, it resembles what is known as a Kuiper Belt object. Pluto is the most famous of the Kuiper Belt objects. So this was likely one of those leftover remnants of our solar system's formation that encountered Neptune and got pulled into orbit by Neptune's gravity. So this is a, a composite movie of images from the Voyager 2 flyby. So there's a nice starry background, uh, just kind of giving a kind of what a view might be if you were out in that part of the solar system. Uh, watching uh, all of this go by. So these are actual views of Triton uh, as it was uh, being imaged by Voyager 2. Again, unfortunately, my movie's having a little bit of an issue here, so I'm going to pause it. But what you're going to notice is that there's a lot of interesting terrain features. In fact, this region right up here is very, very smooth. Um, which indicates it's very young because it's a very old surface, then it's going to, over time, have been battered by craters. Um, it's, this part of the surface is often likened to having the texture of a cantaloupe. But this very, uh, very smooth surface suggests that uh, Triton was actually geologically active. It's not just this frozen ball of rock and ice, but um, it may have had some internal a heat source that has helped keep um, uh, activity going on within it that has shaped uh, the outer surface features. Right, I'm gonna go ahead and skip over my next slide since we are, since this is apparently having some issues. Give me one second here. Um, as Voyager 2 flew by, um, it also noticed some of the geologic activity that was going on. Now, this is a, a very small crop of a low resolution picture of the surface of, of Triton, just a very small area. But Triton was found to have about at least four active geysers on its surface as that material was spewed up into the sky of Neptune and then uh, fell back. Um, it was actually casting a shadow that we can see here. Uh, let's see, and then finally, Neptune, like all of the gas giant planets, um, and which Uranus and Neptune are known as the ice giants because they are 
much farther out than Uranus and Neptune, and they do have lots more ices in their atmospheres. Um, but all of these planets do have ring systems. They're just not as magnificent as Saturn's rings we saw earlier tonight. Um, the rings were actually just are known before um, Voyager 2 got there. And Neptune was kind of interesting because um, its rings apparently had these ring arcs. Um, and you can see in the right side view here that this ring has this high concentration of material in here. And when, so astronomers had detected the presence of these arcs before Voyager 2 got there um, by observing stars that were being occulted by these rings. So as Neptune and its ring system are, are moving around the sun, occasionally Neptune or its rings or both will pass in front of a background star. And so if astronomers watch that star very, very carefully and they monitor the brightness very, very precisely, they can measure little dips in the brightness of a star that as a result of say a ring passing over uh, that star momentarily dimming in a little bit, uh, or it'll wink out completely when a planet passes in front of it. So what was found was that uh, as these rings passed over uh, one of these background stars, we saw a certain amount of, of dip in the brightness. But then when the other side of the rings passed over, we didn't see that same dip. It was a little bit different, which suggested that, there, that the rings weren't uniform. And it really wasn't well understood how that could be because the rings should really even themselves out. But it looks now like uh, it may actually be due to resonances with some of the moons that orbit very close to these rings. Um, in fact, some of the recent observations uh, from the Hubble Space Telescope have shown that some of these ring arcs look like they're actually dissipating and may be gone uh, within a few decades. So um, again, uh, we haven't visited Neptune in a while, but still it's, uh, you can see it in a telescope. Um, you can see Uranus even better. You're not gonna be able to see the rings though. They are just way too thin, way too dark. In fact, they're much darker. Uh, and um, the material that they're made of is much darker than the icy material that we see uh, in uh, Saturn's rings uh, because there's a lot of more organic compounds in those rings. And that organic compounds, they tend to darken over time because of, uh, of ultraviolet radiation from the sun. So they're very, very dark. These are very overexposed images as you can see of the left and right side of the ring system there, but that was required in order to see these very, very dark rings. So Ed, um, if you get a chance, please do try to check out Neptune. Um, and um, you know, it, if you don't find it at first, just keep trying, but look for that, that blue color, it should be pretty prominent. And you'll notice that it is definitely a tiny little ball as compared to those background stars. So uh, let's see here. Um, let's see if we've got any questions before we, we move on here. So uh, why do the moons tend towards rotation in a similar plane? So this actually goes um, as, or the reason that we have these motions is a result of how we think uh, this whole solar system formed out of originally a very large cloud of gas and dust. And so we see examples of solar systems in the process of forming elsewhere in, in our galaxy. But basically as gravity tries to rope or tries to uh, collapse down a rotating uh, a cloud of gas and dust. Centrifugal force actually prevents the, um, the, the collapse uh, from, the side, from the side. So if the cloud is rotating, say this way, uh, the, the centripetal force actually halts eventually the collapse this way, but it can't halt the collapse from gravity this way. And so that material in our cloud then collapses to form a disk. And in that disk, you get material starting to to stick together and run into uh, other pieces of material. And eventually you get these blobs of material that start growing larger and larger. And eventually once they get to say kilometer size, they have enough gravity that they can start very gradually pulling other material in. And it's basically a snowball effect. Uh, the, as more material is added onto an object, its gravity increases, which allows it to pull even more material in. And so these objects then start uh, growing through gravity. But because um, we, we essentially had the same mechanism um, around a forming planet where we have uh, a material in orbit around the forming planet that starts sticking together to form the moons. 
um, all of these objects basically form within that disk. And that's why we see all the planets basically orbiting in roughly the same plane around in our solar system. Um, and so these regular moons, or what we think are, uh, when we say regular, we mean moons that actually formed around these planets. We, uh, we think that they're regular because we see them in uh, basically this, the equatorial plane of that planet, which is right smack dab in the center of that disk out of which the, uh, the planets and those moons formed. And so like Triton, we think that it's one of these uh, uh, objects that got uh, too close to Neptune and got into orbit around it because it's got such a, a, a drastically different orbit from all of those other moons that um, it really couldn't have formed around Neptune and had that type of orbit. Because remember, it's going backwards of what the other planets are or what the other moons are moving. And it's not orbiting in that same plane. It's actually inclined quite a bit. So, um, uh, but yeah, the, the whole reason they're, they're orbiting in that same plane is because of the formation mechanism. So when we look at other stars that are forming, um, uh, in, in these uh, large clouds, we can see disks of material around these stars. And in fact, in some of these disks, we've even detected gaps, which might be due to the presence of planets forming and basically clearing out areas uh, within that disk. Uh, so there was another question, uh, why is a storm centralized in such an intense focused area? So this is basically, um, so the great dark spot or the great red spot these are due to convection within the atmosphere, just like hurricanes on the Earth are formed as a result of convection in the atmosphere and also the rotation of our planet. And so as um, warmer material from below rises up uh, because it's less dense, we get this nice column of air forming. And then as this air is coming up, we've got different zones within the atmosphere at different latitudes that are moving uh, in, in different directions. And they're moving in different directions as a result of the rotation of the planet itself. So um, you basically get this column of air rising up in between, uh, let's say a band of air that's moving this way and a band of air that's moving this way. And so it's kind of like spiraling in between there. Um, we see that with the great red spot um, uh, on Jupiter. Um, and so those bands tend to help uh, keep these storms uh, somewhat uh, uh, kind of condensed down, if you will. Uh, let's see. So do we know what Neptune's rings are composed of? Is it ice like Saturn? So they do have ices, but they've also got uh, a lot of other compounds in them. Like I mentioned before, organic compounds, which are compounds that contain carbon. So as these organic compounds are exposed to ultraviolet radiation, they tend to want to break apart, which tends to free the carbon within those compounds. And if you've ever looked at a, a lump of carbon, it's like coal, okay? So, I mean, these rings are incredibly dark. Um, and so they've really been lightened in, in this image. Uh, so why don't the inner planets have rings? Uh, one of the, the issues is their small mass. And so um, you've got something known as a, a Roche limit that is uh, uh, the limit to which an, a moon or a, a very large object. So uh, not like a, you know, a space station, but something like a moon. The Roche limit is the, is the closest in that an object can, like a moon can get to a planet before the planet's gravity actually ends up shredding it. And so that Roche limit actually scales with the planet. So the rings of Saturn, for example, all of those particles are within that Roche limit, which is why we think that maybe a moon could have gotten too close into one of those uh, to Saturn and got torn apart to form those rings. And so um, these, and, and in all, also in order to have a magnificent ring system, you've really got to have um, you know, a, a large, a fairly large body, or not tremendously large, but you know, it helps to have a, a larger body. So uh, it, it's basically just a, a combination of, of effects that are due to the low mass of, of the planets. Um, so with that, I think I may have taken a little bit too much time, so I apologize. So let me stop my screen share. And I think that we are going to head over to um, now to Adam to finish up our evening and talk a little bit about Mars. So while he's doing that, I'm going to try to get another view in our telescope. So Adam, if you wouldn't mind taking it away. 
All right, thank you very much. Uh, well, I have to say we've had some excellent questions from our audience. Uh, it actually it really enhances the program and it makes it more worthwhile and uh, more live. And you know that's what we're it's all about. Um, getting you know educating, teaching, sharing the night sky. So I was going to be talking about Mars. And if um, you have been following the news a little bit, um, <clears throat> you might have heard that Mars is at opposition right now. And what that means is, is that Mars is opposite the sky of the sun. But think about this. What it also means is, is that when you look at our solar system from above, as an example, um, let's see, from above, you're going to be looking down at the orbits of each of the planets. So Earth is the third planet from the sun. Mars is the fourth planet from the sun. Because Earth is closer to the sun, it goes around the sun faster in its orbit. Earth takes one year to go around once. Mars is a little over two years. So um, what's going to happen is about every two years or so, there's a point in which Earth is kind of overtaking Mars in our two respective orbits. And think of them as little race tracks, like the little slot cars, they can't leave that little slot. And so the inner car will go faster on the inner curve than the outer car or outer slot car. And so Earth is overtaking. So where we are is at that point where we are overtaking Mars. And Mars is also what, at what is called perihelion. And that means that it is at its closest position in its orbit because its orbit is oval shaped egg shaped all orbits are oval shaped there's no such thing as a perfectly circular orbit anywhere and so there's a point where uh, a, a planet going around the sun a moon going around a planet it goes on like that can be closer to what it's orbiting and another time uh, on the other side of its orbit that's farther away. So we actually have both of those things to our advantage. <clears throat> also, Mars, if you actually look at it now or in the next 30 minutes, you're going to see it's really high up. And so it's actually getting above, uh, you know, that thick atmosphere that you see down at the horizon. And the higher an object is in the sky, the less of the atmosphere it's looking through. Perfect situation is zenith which is then one atmosphere. Anything lower than zenith, the point directly over your head, you're looking through a thicker and thicker amount of atmosphere. And so that will dim the image. It also means that it's more turbulent air that you're looking through and greater chance of turbulent air. So that said, right now, uh, we're actually just uh, about a, a number of days past opposition. And we have another month or so for excellent viewing where we can see Mars look larger than normal. Now, I'm, I wanna show you some quick, quick uh, images. I took this particular image um, about a week or two ago, about two weeks ago. You can see it's small. You're gonna see some dark areas on there. Anybody who's familiar with Mars will notice that little kind of triangular little pointy bit that is Certus Major. That, and very teeny tiny on the very tippy top, tiny little white circle, that is the southern polar cap of Mars. This is how Mars is tonight. You're not gonna, no, this is not a photograph that I took, uh, but, it's at this time. I'm only four minutes off. Um, you're going to see kind of a dark area kind of crossing uh, the middle of the planet. If we were able to, we would see a little polar cap and also Olympus Mounds and Tharsis Bulge, which are huge volcanoes on Mars. No, we're not going to see that. I just wanted to show you that. Um, then also what Billy's going to try to show you are the moons the two moons of Mars, Phobos and Deimos. Phobos is very close to Mars right now. Deimos is at a distance. He did show us a photo that he took the other day. So he should be able to show that. Um, I also wanna show you, oops, very quickly, this image. 
This kind of tells the story. And then I'm going to show you what I am showing, what I am seeing of Mars. But I wanted to kind of give you a, a, a basis of understanding. Notice this image. You're going to see the moon, our moon, 33 arc minutes wide in that image, or 1980 arc seconds. You remember the double cluster I showed you earlier? That was about 30 arc minutes together for both clusters as far as their size, 30 arc minutes. The moon is about that same size. Notice the two images of Mars above the moon in this picture. It is just an illustration. It is not a photograph, but the bigger image is how we see it now. As you can see, it was a week ago. And you see how tiny Mars is. And then below it, farthest from the Earth, three and a half arc seconds, it's this micro little dot. That's why astronomers, both professional and amateur, get all excited about opposition because it's so much larger looking than it normally is, even though it is smaller looking than many of the craters on the moon as far as how we see it. So it's still pretty tiny, but it's better. Okay, here's the live image of Mars. I apologize, the atmosphere is um, not being kind to me. Uh, you're gonna notice the disk of Mars. You're gonna see kind of that dark uh, area going across Mars near the middle there, slightly above middle. I hope you do see that. That dark area is basalt. It is a rock that is formed from lava flows. It is the same basaltic type rock we see on Earth, especially in the ocean floors when our tectonic plates spread apart and magma from below upwells and uh, cools off and hardens. That is basalt rock. Also on the moon, basalt, that's the dark maria, the seas, put quotes around that, those dark large areas. That's lava flows, that's basalt, same on Mars. So a similar type of geology in the sense of the same rock is seen in many places. Um, the red color, of course, it's not red, it's kind of orangish. Well, the surface of Mars is kind of a desert with exposed basaltic rock or sand covered areas, but that color is from iron oxide, rust. So Mars is a rusty world. Uh, the reason the name for Mars is uh, named for the god of war because it looked in the sky like a drop of blood hanging there in the sky. Um, of course, that's not what it really is. It's rust. And because of the iron, bits of iron in the sand, or we'll call it soil, but it's not living soil, um, has oxidized. That means it was exposed to oxygen. Where do we find that? Water. Water once covered a lot of Mars. It has evaporated away over, the, over time. Its atmosphere is so thin that it can't hold an atmosphere nor even an ocean. And so all the water and everything is just evaporated into space. There's a little bit of water in the atmosphere. You'll see some occasional white clouds. You will also see uh, in the polar caps, frozen water. And down below the surface in the permafrost of Mars is frozen water. And so if we're able to extract that water with uh, remote drilling type devices, you can get drinking water. You can split the water into hydrogen and oxygen, then compress it. You've got fuel. That's what the space shuttle ran on was liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen. And so a lot of great things from that. And that means we don't have to carry a whole bunch of water if we want to go to Mars and send people. Um, notice the dark areas. You can Every once in a while, you're going to see some features there. On the very top, um, I'm seeing the polar cap, just a little flash of white on the very tippy top. I know Billy will have a better view of Mars than I do here, but I wanted to show you what I'm seeing. But you can see how it's just dancing around. The seeing is not good. Hey, Adam, um, um, sorry to interrupt, but no. if you want, to, want me to switch over to my view, our seeing is a little bit better here. I bet it is. Um, how will we do this? I see a question. Um, are you going to manually just take the image and do yours? 
Um, I mean, if you just want to continue talking, um, I'll I'll show my view, and then when you're ready Excellent. to try to pull up one of the moons, just let me know. Okay, so bring up your image. <clears throat> yeah, that's better. <laughs> yeah, you can see that elongated dark area, um, which you kind of see on mine, but uh, what <clears throat> Billy is showing is more features, especially um, below that dark area. So you're going to get these slight variations. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they have a much larger telescope and better seeing where they are. Mine is just taunting me. It's dancing around. So the question, does Mars get to Zenith in cooler weather? That's a great question. Um, what's actually happening is, uh, all right. Do you remember how Billy talked about Nept uh, Neptune? and the moons of Neptune being in that plane and along the equator. And we also saw how with Saturn, we saw the ring system of Saturn on the equator. Well, take that the same dynamics and apply it to the solar system. The planets orbit the sun in a plane and it's at the same plane of the sun's rotation because they all formed at the same time. And so, we will see Mars as well as the other planets along what we call the ecliptic, which is the apparent path the sun makes across the sky. This time of year, the ecliptic gets very high in our sky at night. In the summertime, the ecliptic is very low. Because of where Mars is in its orbit, we're seeing it at this time of year, therefore we're seeing it high up. So it actually has nothing to do with, our, with the weather but uh, where it is in the solar system orbit, orbital plane. Uh, and then how do you get it to run on liquid oxygen? Okay, um, the space shuttle, you saw the big external tank, half of, half of it or two thirds, I can't remember the ratio, but anyway, let's say half of that was liquid ox oxygen and the other half was liquid hydrogen. When you expo um, expose those two to each other, when you mix those two, it is highly explosive. That's rocket fuel, and that's what the space shuttle uses. Um, and that's what goes through the engines of the space shuttle. It'll be the same thing that's going through the engines of the SLS when it's finally finished and we're actually able, and other rockets. The solid rocket boosters on the side of the space shuttle, that is a solid rocket fuel. And it's like a Roman candle. Once you light those suckers, you can't turn them off. But you can control liquid oxygen and hydrogen and how they mix and how much they go through the engine and throttle down and all those wonderful things. Um, and, and it just takes the, the ability to compress it to uh, get it cold. Um, so I hope I've answered that question well. Um, Billy, did you want to add anything or? Um, I was just going to bring up our exposure here um, okay. and see if we can get something here. The um, yeah, the seeing is still not very good. Let me bring up our exposure a bit more and bring our gain down. Yeah, yeah is right. That the yeah, the right there. Yeah, it's really hard to see, and he's kind of going in and out because our our seeing is right. not. Can that you good. increase the exposure because it was visible then? A little bit better there. There you go. Yeah. So that one is Demos. Yes. Uh, now Phobos is, right. actually, is actually down here, but right now it's oh. a bit too close to Mars for me to be able to to pull it out. I've been playing with the settings and <laughs> can't get a, a happy compromise. But at least we got the one moon there. But um, I'll bring up the um, the other screen right quick. Uh, so this was a, uh, an overlaid view that I got the other night. Um, so I've taken the overexposed Mars and overlaid a regular exposure, but you can see right there, there's Phobos and there's Deimos there. Now my, my view is a little bit rotated from what it was the other night. And that's why the moon, uh, uh, this moon down here is not way up here now, but, um, and I guess just one other thing is here's what they actually look like. 
So these guys are likely asteroids. Um, they, they have a lot of characteristics of, of asteroids, but they do orbit around the equator of Mars. They, um, they are in pretty, pretty circular orbits, but they are very likely captured asteroids, but the, the jury is still kind of out on that. And one thing I, I forgot to put in here, but I'd encourage you all to look up is the rovers on Mars um, have been able to take a picture of the sun as one of the, or as actually both of these moons have passed over the sun and created an eclipse. So it doesn't block out the sun like we have here on, on the earth, but you can see this little dark feature going across uh, the sun there, which is pretty neat. Um, and one final thing, uh, Phobos, which is uh, the closest in of those two, it actually orbits the planet faster than what the planet rotates. And so if you were standing on Mars watching, um, you would actually see Phobos rise up over in the west and then gradually move across the sky and set over in the east, which is kind of uh, weird how, you know, especially comparing it to what we see here uh, on the Earth. But that, that's the only thing that, um, that I had. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I would say they're probably captured asteroids. Um, and they're really tiny. I can't remember the exact size, something like 50 miles or something. Actually, I got it right here. Um, Phobos, our largest one at maximum is 26 kilometers. So it's about 15 okay. miles wide at its maximum. <laughs> uh, yeah, pretty dangerous. Yeah, they're very tiny. Um, yeah, they're just little itty bitty guys right there. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, just I don't see any extra questions, but the, that one image, yes, Demos, the one that was live was at the two o'clock position. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's one of those things. Um, right now, if if you're able to have steady skies, I mean I'm I'm just thrilled I can see a nice round disc and I can see general features on Mars. I just wish it was steadier. But another bane of the astronomer is uh, global dust storms. And Billy, did you show a picture like that the other time? I think you're muted. Uh, yeah, but one. Um, if you give me one second, I will. Okay, I'll just talk briefly, and you can bring it up. Uh, these dust storms occur, and because the atmosphere is just so thin, it's one one hundredth the amount of the atmosphere here on earth. So even if it was air, you couldn't breathe much. You couldn't breathe it because there's almost nothing there. Um, but that dust is, is like a powder. It's almost like baby powder, but it's a different kind of material, but it's that fine. And because of that low atmosphere, that stuff just aerates and it just gets all over the place. And as you can see in this image, it will, cover the entire planet now mars is about half the sun, half the diameter of the earth so it's, it's you know twice the diameter of the moon half the diameter of the earth of the earth but um just thinking about one storm system that affects the entire planet is pretty amazing and you can see what happens to the view totally washes out anything that you can see Right now there is no dust storm. And so we're still lucky enough to be able to see something. And there's been thought that it's, it's related to um, increased temperature from the sun as it gets at perihelion and um, somehow affecting this. I, I don't know, Billy, if you've heard any other kind of relationships. Um, a lot of it is thought to be done with or due to the uh, effects on the polar ice caps. So a lot of that CO2, so a lot of the, the oh. ice that are here are, are CO2 or carbon dioxide or dry ice. And that sublimates and can kick up winds. Um, so that's all that I, I can add to that right now. Okay. Yeah, the polar caps actually change in size mm -hmm. um, from, their, from Mars's summer and winter, depending on the north or the southern pole. Um, the, it's, it's cold enough that the water ice never melts, but the temperature fluctuation at the poles is enough that the carbon dioxide can freeze or evaporate. Um, it's, right, it's fluctuating above and below that freezing point. 
uh, for carbon dioxide. Um, <clears throat> and so the caps can actually look different depending on the season, on Mars's season. And, okay, do I have better seeing purely due to elevation being in East Tennessee? Well, uh, to answer that question, uh, I'm, I'm actually observing from my home. I'm at 3,000 feet. Um, that can be a, a slight benefit, but I'm in the mountains, and that can make the sky very turbulent. Where uh, Billy is at Vanderbilt in, near Nashville, it's flat out there with some rolling hills. And um, so it just kind of depends. Um, sometimes we have had excellent seeing here and generally excellent, more better weather because we're a little higher altitude and <clears throat> the valley areas will tend to get sucked in with moisture. But, um, you know, out west in the desert is excellent. Uh, also um, in the ocean where there's just no mountains or nothing, it's water. There's very laminar flow and you can have excellent seeing. So it's, it kind of depends. You get a, a front coming through and that's it. It's gonna tear up the atmosphere anyway. It doesn't matter where you are. So it's all kind of a luck of, you know, luck of the draw kind of thing. <laughs> We're all shaking our heads, yes. We all know about that. <laughs> yep. All right, well, thank you all so much. Um, so are there any other questions from our audience? I mean, it could be about anything that we've spoken about tonight. And while you all are pondering that, I just wanna mention something I forgot to mention at the beginning of the show. Um, it was in our, our, our preliminary slideshow, but um, on Dyer's homepage, uh, we've got links to some star charts for, uh, that are set to basically for tonight, but you can use them uh, throughout the month and into next month as well, but it highlights where a lot of the objects, actually all of the objects are that we were talking about tonight. So, uh, you know, download that and check it out. Um, there's two versions, one that doesn't use very much ink at all, so you can print that out if you want to, or a really nice color, colorful version if you want to just use your computer or your phone. So, so it does not look like we have any, oh wait, no. Uh, is the smoke from the fires out west affecting your seeing? So I know that uh, we've had, uh, we actually saw a fair amount of the smoke come in at times, I think it was about a month ago, and that did, uh, it, I don't know if I'd say it, it affected our seeing, but it, uh, as in the, the turbulence, but it, it definitely did hinder some of the light that was coming through. So it made things, uh, I, I remember looking at Jupiter, we had just gotten some of our new cameras in, and Jupiter and Saturn were noticeably oranger uh, in the views than what, say, we saw tonight. So I don't know about the, the rest of everybody else, but. I didn't, <clears throat> we didn't actually see the smoke here where we live, but because I think it went north of us. Um, we had heard from friends from, you know, the, the Midwest and like Chicago, and they were seeing tons of smoke. There's a lot of different factors that go into how well you can see something in the sky. The term seeing relates to uh, turbulence. How steady is the sky? Then there's transparency, which is how clear is the sky? So out west, there's like, it's really clean air. There's nothing in there. There's no pollen like we have out here. So, um, you know, I mean, their night skies are pitch black. It's it's like a planetarium theater. It's just, you know, amazing. Or being out in the middle of the ocean. Uh, <clears throat> and, then, and then it's just what's in the atmosphere. If you have a bunch of junk in it, we have pollen and stuff. And so that's going to attenuate the view where it may darken it just because of scattering, but also it's scattering the light. So it's going to, like Billy said, it would make the image uh, redder. Um, and, uh, and I had noticed kind of some kind of brownish haze off to the east at sunset. So I'm wondering if we are seeing a little bit of the current uh, fires. Mm -hmm. And um, and then altitude, if you go to like 10,000, 15,000 feet, way high altitude, 
you're getting above the Earth's atmosphere. Remember, here, wherever you live, Zenith is one atmosphere. That ground le that's at ground level. 3,000 feet here, uh, you know, like 95%, 98% atmosphere above us. You get to 10,000 feet, 20,000. You're looking through a much smaller fraction of the amount of the atmosphere. And it's almost like being in space, though obviously not. And that's why observatories, big ones, are way up top, giant high mountains. Um, so they can get, they're looking through a much smaller amount of the actual Earth's atmosphere. I'll stop talking there. All right. Uh, anything else from any of our other presenters? It's been a good night. I can smell, I think, smoke from a couple of, uh, we got a campground about a mile away and it's Saturday night. And I think we have a few campfires going down there. I was trying to decide if I could smell a skunk or not. I'm just gonna pretend I don't know. <laughs> well, hopefully the smell doesn't get stronger and stronger. <laughs> uh, there was a question. Can I ask for links to everyone's astrophotography stuff if it's published somewhere? I would love to see it. Yeah. Um, See, we don't have anything currently for Dyer, um, but uh, Jeremy or Adam or Theo or, or, uh, or John. What do you think? Can we share our Flickr page? Or if you want to. I have a Flickr page with uh, some of Merrill's images. Be happy to share that. He's got quite a, quite a collection. Which, by the way, on behalf of everyone, I want to thank Merrill for uh, letting us make use of this observatory virtually. It's very impressive. And thank you so much for that opportunity. You're welcome. He's happy to help. <laughs> I think you still have the, the, the biggest gun though. Um, yeah. Billy. So a little bit of resentment over here, but we'll, we'll, we'll get over it. <laughs> well, it's a 20, yeah, it's a 24 inch telescope and somebody's going to get a 26 inch telescope, but ours will still outweigh them. I mean, it's, it's the telescope itself is about a ton. So Oh my God. I think we'll hold that title for a little while. <laughs> Enjoy the well last. Yeah, exactly. Yep. All right. Well, thank you all again, all of our presenters. This was awesome. Um, and thanks to all the folks behind the scenes, uh, Nathan, Alex, Brian, uh, couldn't have done it without you. So uh, we'll, look, we'll start looking at what we can do in November. And I know some of you may have questions about, um, you know, what kind of telescope to buy. Uh, so we may be doing some segments on that um, and, you know, just check out all of the, 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 the different groups that have been on tonight, the Barnard Seaford Astronomical Society, the Memphis Astronomical Society, Bayes Mountain Park and Planetarium, and Dyer Observatory. I don't think I'm leaving anybody out, um, but, you know, we're going to have stuff posted on there, different resources. So if you have questions about telescopes or, or anything, you feel free to contact any of us and we'll be happy to try to answer to the best of our ability. So, all right. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. We look forward to seeing you all in November. So just check out our, our the Dyer homepage uh, for updates on when our next star party will be. Hope everyone has a great rest of the weekend. All right, everybody. <laughs> I like